Hi sisters, um, how are you all doing today? Um, I have to just say this right up front, um, I get extremely nervous um, about teaching in general, even though that's kind of what I do for a living, but church teaching is totally different. Um, but having to teach virtually like this um, is, is extra scary. Um, now I don't have to just feel my face getting red while I talk, I actually get to witness it up close firsthand, so that's especially horrible. Um, so I uh, would really like to extend a very sincere thank you um, to our amazing Relief Society teachers that have been doing this the whole time um, during this pandemic. Um, thank you so much. Um, I want to introduce myself uh, to those of you who don't know me. Um, I know we have um, quite a few people, new people in our ward. Um, so my name is Megan Lang. Uh, I am from Provo, Utah. I am married to Tyson Lang, who is from here in Moses Lake. Uh, we have been married for over 20 years, and we met while attending college at Utah Valley University. Um, we moved to Spokane about five years after we got married so he could attend Gonzaga Law School. Um, at the end of 2009, about a year after he graduated, we moved to Moses Lake and started attending Second Ward, and we have been here ever since. Um, I love this town. I love this ward. Um, I'm so glad I get to raise our two sons, Jack and Bob here. Um, Jack is 15 and a half and Bob is almost 11. Um, I am currently the first counselor in the Relief Society presidency. Um, and this week we met as a presidency and discussed kind of what we wanted to teach for this fifth Sunday lesson. Um, so we decided to go with the Come Follow Me lesson for this week, but concentrating on the Book of Mormon translation and even more specifically, um, from the perspective of Anna Smith. Um, I thought it'd be cool to get a woman's perspective on this. Um, and at the very end of the lesson for this week, um, under the heading Voices of the Restoration, uh, it reads, in April 1829, the month when sections six through nine of the Doctrine and Covenants were received, Joseph Smith's main work was the translation of the Book of Mormon. When asked later to relate how this record was translated, Joseph said that it was not intended to tell the world all the, partic all the particulars. He was often stated simply that it was translated by the gift of God. We don't know any details about this miraculous translation process, but we do know that Joseph Smith was a seer aided by instruments that God had prepared, two transparent stones called the Urim and Thummim, and another stone called the Seer Stone. The lesson continues to include statements from eyewitnesses to the translation process that support Joseph's witness. One of those eyewitnesses listed is Emma Smith. Um, as I researched Emma for this lesson, I have to tell you I had some preconceived notions of Emma um, growing up. Uh, I didn't hear a whole lot about Emma Smith in the church. Um, maybe it was because of, you know, kind of what happened after Joseph was killed. Um, you know, she didn't follow the saints to Salt Lake. Um, she kind of had a falling out with the church leaders at the time, um, you know, the whole RLDS church thing. Um, but whatever the reason may be, uh, her stellar, her less than stellar reputation is totally unwarranted. Um, upon reading about her life, I learned that Emma was a very extraordinary woman. Um, <laughs> someone should really give a sacrament talk about her life. Not me, of course, not me, but someone else should definitely do that. Um, as I kind of went down the rabbit hole of learning about Emma and her witness to the translation process, I found something that I had never heard of. Um, I don't know if I'm tardy to the party on this. Maybe you have all heard about this, but I hadn't. Um, that there were actually four women witnesses to the Book of Mormon um, translation. And um, not only witness, but they also aided in the translation as well. Um, there's an article entitled Four Women uh, were witnesses to the Book of Mormon translation process. Uh, it was written by Marianne Holman Prescott. She's a church news staff writer, um, and she tells about the account of these four women. Uh, it reads, within the first few pages of the Book of Mormon, readers come across 11 witnesses, each of whom has signed his name as someone who has either seen or felt the ancient plates that Joseph used to translate the Book of Mormon. Although their names aren't included in the official list, Four women can be added as additional witnesses of the physical reality and divine process Joseph Smith went through the translation in the translation of the Book of Mormon. 
Each of these women, Mary Whitmer, Lucy Mack Smith, Lucy Harris, and Emma Smith, aided in the translation of the Book of Mormon and offered her own witness of the plate's realty. Or reality. I'm not sure how to pronounce that word. Uh, Amy Easton Flake said during one of the sessions of the Sperry Symposium on October 23rd, by recognizing their contributions, we not only place women back into the narrative into which they were integral actors, but we also expand the scope of ways to witness and what it means to be a witness. Um, recognizing the four names are familiar to many church members. Sister Easton Flake joined with Rachel Cope, both assistant professors in the religion department at BYU, in sharing insights regarding the important role the four women play in the translation of the Book of Mormon. Touch, sound, spiritual impressions, and visions may in fact produce, as these women illustrate so clearly, these women illustrate so clearly, a more lasting and more powerful experience than sight. Sister Easton Flake said, in turn, through these women's witnesses, we see how the translation of the Book of Mormon both required and created a community male, female, young, and old, family, and friends who work together on this important project. Um, the first lady, uh, first woman that she mentions is Mary Musselman Whitmer. She's sometimes referred to as the 12th witness by historians because of the parallel experience to that of the canonized witnesses. Mary Whitmer is the only known woman to have physically seen the plates, uh, Sister Easton Flake said. In June 1829, Mary and her husband, Peter Whitmer, opened their home to Joseph and Emma Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Because of the Whitmer's hospitality, Joseph was able to focus his efforts on translation, allowing the process to move forward rapidly. On top of a large family of her own and many responsibilities in the home, Mary Whitmer began to feel her labor was too much. I think we can sympathize with that. As those feelings began to grow, a stranger appeared to her, explaining the work that was going on in her home, and showed her the plates. He encouraged her in her work and soon vanished. Because of that experience, Mary was able to continue in her labors, helping the work move forward. Many of her family would later be witnesses to the plates. It's very cool. Although the Whitmer family members had a falling out with the church, Mary is among those who never altered or denied her testimony of the plate's realty, their divine origin, and the message contained in the book of in the book translated from them. Okay, the second uh, woman mentioned is Lucy Mack Smith. As a memoirist and as a participant in the events surrounding the translation of the and publication of the Book of Mormon, Lucy Mack Smith introduced uh, introduces various ways of witnessing beyond the visual, including record keeping, sensory experiences, and spiritual impressions, Sister Cope said. The Prophet Joseph would often share his experiences with his family, including descriptions of the account on the plates before he had even had them in his possession. Although the Smiths lacked tangible evidence of the plates at this time, they experienced spiritual confirmation and thus they anxiously awaited the day when Joseph would receive the important record he had described. Sister Cope said, together the family became witnesses of the Book of Mormon even prior to Joseph acquiring the plates. After Joseph had obtained the plates, Lucy and other family members saw their outline through the cloth that covered them and even handled them on occasion. In addition to the visual and audible witness, Lucy would help uh, find hiding places for the plates and often defended the realty of the plates. Okay, the third woman mentioned is Lucy Harris. Um, I know she's a little bit more unusual, but I think there's a lot more to her story than we know or recognize, Sister Cope said. Within the pages of her memoir, Lucy Max Smith introduces her readers to Lucy Harris. Although Lucy Harris is typically remembered for her antagonism toward the Book of Mormon, it is important to recognize that Lucy Smith's history reveals another side of this complex figure. Um, shortly after Emma, Joseph and Emma had obtained the plates, Joseph asked his mother if she would speak with their wealthy acquaintance, Martin Harris. Uh, the mother agreed, but decided to first meet with Harris's wife. According to Lucy, Lucy Smith's account, Lucy Harris was intrigued and it, um, expressed an immediate interest in the plates, offering to donate a considerable sum of money from her own private purse for Joseph's translation uh, efforts. But prior to the donation, Lucy Harris wanted to see the plates. 
there was a catch, and Joseph refused. Um, Harris, who was staying in a Smith home overnight, retired to bed following her conversation with Joseph. Sister Cope said, The following morning, Lucy Harris shared a very remarkable experience that she had had that night with the Smith family. In her dream, she recalled a personage that appeared to her and chastised her for interfering with the work. The angel then showed her the plates, resulting in a powerful witness. Upon waking up, Lucy Harris insisted on giving Joseph $28, personal money she had received from her mother prior to her mother's death. Although Lucy Harris did eventually become antagonistic to the work, Lucy Smith confided that she continued to believe in their physical uh, realty, Sister Cope said. Okay, and last but not least, um, Emma Smith. Uh, as the person closest to Joseph and with him from the beginning to the very end of the translation process, Emma was arguably more intimately involved with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon than any other individual besides Joseph. Sister Easton Flake said. Um, that's a pretty profound uh, statement. Um, in uh, a book that Lucy Smith wrote, it's called The History of the Prophet Joseph Smith by his mother. Um, she wrote an amazing tribute to uh, Emma. She writes, I have never seen a woman in my life who would endure every species of hardship from month to month and from year to year with that unflinching courage, zeal, and patience which she has ever done. For I know that which she has had to endure, she has been tossed upon the ocean of uncertainty. She has breasted storms of persecution and buffered the rage of men and devils, which have would have borne down almost any other woman. Um, in another article that I came across while uh, researching Emma, um, I came across an article that was written by her great-great-granddaughter, uh, and it's called My Great-Great-Grandmother, Emma Hale Smith. Um, and this uh, lady gives a absolutely brilliant account of her great-great-grandmother, Emma. Um, I really encourage everyone to read this article about Emma's life. Um, she was truly an amazing uh, lady. Sorry, <laughs> I don't want to cry. Um, Emma's involvement with the plates began the day she accompanied Joseph to the Hill Cumorah to obtain the plates. I didn't know that she was there um, when he went to go get the plates, so that was, um, that's pretty cool. Um, and then she continued later acting as a scribe and witnessing the translation process. Um, although she never saw the plates, at times they were placed under their bed. She would sometimes move them as she cleaned, and other times she would see them wrapped in a small cloth. Um, I kind of had a visual of that. I, imagine you know sweeping the floor um you know or something and having to move these sacred uh, metal plates you're not allowed to see them um and i wonder if it ever maybe annoyed her got on her nerves like you know how i get annoyed when my husband leaves something out for you know the umpteenth time and i have to move it or put it back you know where it belongs while i'm cleaning i don't know maybe she had a similar feeling maybe not i don't know it's kind of funny to think about um in the Come Follow Me lesson this week, Emma states, uh, when my husband was translating the Book of Mormon, I wrote a part of it as he dictated each sentence word for word. And when he came to proper names he could not pronounce or long words, he spelled them out. And while I was writing them, if I made um, any mistake in spelling, he would stop me, correct my spelling, although it was impossible for him to see how I was writing them down at the time. Even the word Sarah, he could not pronounce at first, but had to spell it, and I would pronounce it for him. The plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth, which I had given him to fold them in. I once felt the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable like thick paper, and would rustle with a metallic sound, and when the edges were moved by the thumb, as one does sometimes thumb the edges of a book, um, Sister Easton Flake states, This complete assurance of the realty of the plates, despite her never seeing them, is a powerful statement about the validity of every witness to see beyond the visual. Almost two centuries later, the miracles of this great work may resonate more and grow greater faith when, rec when we recognize how God used dedicated men and women to bring forth this great work of translation and restoration. Um, in the last testimony of Sister Emma, it's uh, this is found in the Saints Herald, October 1st, 1879, 
Um, right before Emma died in April of that same year, Emma gave um, one final testimony of the Book of Mormon. Uh, she says, My belief is that the Book of Mormon is of divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writing of the manuscripts unless he was inspired. For when acting as his scribe, Joseph would dictate to me hour after hour and when returning after meals or after interruptions. He would at once begin where he left, had left off without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. This was a usual thing for him to do. It would have been improbable that a learned man could do this. Improbable that a learned man could do this. And for one so ignorant and unlearned as he was, it was simply impossible. Um, I want to leave you with a quote from Elder Holland regarding the Book of Mormon. Um, he says, For 179 years, the Book of Mormon has been examined and attacked denied and deconstructed, targeted and torn apart like perhaps no other religious history, perhaps like no other book in any religious history, and still it stands. So whether you believe, you know, the Book of Mormon to be true or not, that book exists. It's it's there. Um, even the early witnesses who eventually, you know, fell away from the church or had a falling out with the church never did deny um, its existence and authenticity. Um, I encourage everyone to read it and pray to see if it's true for yourself. Um, I know that it'll strengthen your testimony and bring you closer, uh, bring you closer to your heavenly Father. And I humbly say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And since this is YouTube, I guess I need to say thanks for watching. Please subscribe and have a wonderful day. Bye.